Hey everybody and happy Saturday. Today we are returning to the story of Philo T. Farnsworth, who first appeared on our show on September 18th, 2013. He is known as the father of television, and that invention led to a decade-long patent battle. If you like this kind of history, our network also has a brand new show that's all about inventors and entrepreneurs. It's The Brink with Ariel Kasten and Jonathan Strickland. Every week, they explore the story of people who took big steps in the world of business without knowing exactly where they were going to land on the other side. So stay tuned at the end of this episode for the trailer to The Brink. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And we've had some scientist episodes lately and we're going to have another. Yep. If any of our listeners watch Futurama, you will recognize the name Farnsworth. But unless you listen to the creator's commentary tracks on the show's DVD releases, or you are a fan of television history, you might not know that the crotchety mad scientist on the show is actually named for a real scientist of the 20th century who was a Utah farm boy that actually kind of changed the way humans see the world. Do you you know who might recognize the name and the connection? Who? People who watch Warehouse 13. Oh, yeah, which I don't watch. Yeah. I don't have that point of reference. They have these Farnsworth devices that are totally Mm. based on this technology. And there is even, it's a little old at this point. It's got some age on it. It hasn't been updated in a while free iOS app that makes your (laughs) iPhone into a Farnsworth device. Interesting. It's pretty cool. And the scientist we're talking about today is Philo T. Farnsworth, and he was interested in science almost from birth. Uh, He was inventing things as early as grade school, but his real claim to fame in terms of technology is uh, in television. He also has become something of an icon representing the little guy because he went up against uh, a big business in a patent lawsuit in kind of a David versus Goliath situation. Yeah, which ends both happily and sadly. Yeah, it it doesn't have quite as satisfying an ending as the David and Goliath story. (laughs) Yeah. uh, We'll talk about that a little later. We will. He's a fascinating, fascinating man and so insightful at such an early age that it kind of blows my mind. Uh, And I, I also feel compelled to mention right out of the gate that a lot of the history with him is Uh, all based on verbal accounts that various people have given. So there's some variation, like sometimes even his age will change, you know, in two different versions of the story, even though they're close. And we'll account for most of those, but uh, it would really be cumbersome to be like, well, this person said he was, you know, it was this year. This person said it was this year. If they're close, I don't always like break out and go, no, this was two different accounts. We're Assume there might be some age range changes Mm -hmm. by, you know. We're dealing with an oral account. Yes, it's all oral history coming from multiple people. For much of the earlier part. Yeah. Uh, So he was born, we know, in Utah in August uh, of 1906. He was born on August 19th. His name was Philo Taylor Farnsworth. And uh, he was born in a log cabin that was actually built by his grandfather, who was a Mormon pioneer. So he was part of a, a... Utah family that had really come over with the Mormon tradition as they came to kind of settle the area. When he was 12, the family moved to Franklin, Idaho. And his first sort of scientific triumph happened when he was 13. He entered a national science contest, which was sponsored by Science and Invention magazine, and he won it. And his idea was a tamper-proof lock for a Model T ignition switch. Apparently at the time there really wasn't, like, a way to lock a Model T. All the keys were basically the same for the ignition from car to car to car. So he had figured out a way to make one key for one car. Somehow the idea of of a Model T theft ring brought on by (laughs) non-secure ignition switches is really funny to me. It is. During high school, he converted all of his family's home appliances to electric power, which... Uh, is pretty impressive considering that they had not had electricity in their home until he was 14. Yeah, and he allegedly learned all of this. Uh, the sort of apocryphal story is that he found electrical manuals and like technical diagrams in the house that they had 
moved into at some point that the previous owner had left behind, and he just studied those and learned how electricals worked. As a kid, you know, I can see an an adult doing that, like having kind of the focus of mind to like break it down. Well, that's what happens on Orange is the New Black. (laughs) It is what happens. Uh, And then when he was... uh, 16 or 13 or 14 or 15, depending on who you talk to. Uh, Some accounts say it was 1921. There's actually a television appearance that Farnsworth made where he says it's 1922, but we know it's right around 15 or 16. Uh, He sketched out a concept for a vacuum tube and he showed it to his high school chemistry teacher, Justin Tolman. And Farnsworth had detailed this idea that by controlling the speed and direction of electrons, he could turn electricity into pictures using the vacuum tube. So the idea was that the tube would shoot electrons toward a screen and project an image. And this was all theoretical. He hadn't, of course, been able to test any of this. He was just thinking through how he thought it would work. He had kind of made it up in his head and drawn it. Yeah. And according to legend, he got the idea from the parallel plowing rows on the family farm, thinking that an electron beam could do a similar line-by-line scan of an image. And there are different accounts of whether that was uh, a field of potatoes or beets. (laughs) But we know it was a field with straight lines that was being plowed on the farm. So as the story goes, his teacher did not quite get what he was talking about, and his fellow students didn't either. I'm imagining the teacher kind of patting him on the head and going, that's nice, dear. Well, Whatever you say, except he was 15. Well, and Tolman hung on to that sketch. Yeah. There was something about it that he thought, like, this is interesting enough that I'm going to keep it. Maybe this is a real thing and not space magic. (laughs) Yeah. So after high school, Farnsworth attended Brigham Young University starting in 1922. But unfortunately, his education hit an early roadblock. When his father died in 1924, he had to drop out of school so that he could help work and support the family, and this really put an end to his formal education. But his scientific work didn't stop there. He kept learning on his own, tinkering and experimenting, one of the many self-taught people that we've talked about in the podcast. Yeah, we do, a lot of our big names in uh, science history and invention are really self-taught, which I think is uh, an interesting through line. And in 1926, uh, Philo married Elma Pem Gardner, and they would eventually have four children together. We won't go into depth on their kids, but I wanted to make a note. That same year, he was able to get enough cash together to move into full-time research. He'd been working for two professional fundraisers. They were George Everson and Leslie Gorell in Southern California in their bulk mailing business. After Farnsworth told his bosses about his concept for an electronic television, the uh, pair formed this venture partnership with him as Everson, Farnsworth, and Gorell. Uh, Additional investment came from the Crocker Bank under President William W. Crocker, and a new group, Crocker Research Laboratories, was formed. Crocker and yet another investor, Roy N. Bishop, were based in San Francisco, and consequently they wanted Farnsworth to move closer to where they were. So with all of this funding in place, Farnsworth set up a lab at 202 Green Street, which is at the bottom of Telegraph Hill in San Francisco, with his wife Pem and her brother Cliff Gardner as his assistants. In 1927, in January, Farnsworth filed for his first patents for his television system. And later that year, on September 7th, he unveiled his electronic television prototype, and it was the first of its kind. It featured a video camera tube, which he also called an image dissector. It was essentially the same thing he had sketched as a teenager and shown to his slightly befuddled (laughs) chemistry teacher. Yeah. That's going to be important later as well. Uh, The first image that he transmitted was really just a blurry line. But working with his research team, uh, because he hired more people on and they were dubbed the lab gang, he was able to pretty quickly advance the technology. And he was sending progressively more complex shapes. And within a few years, he actually sent signals to a location that was eight blocks away at the Merchants Exchange building. During all of this time of really rapid development, they actually had an enormous setback. In late 1928, the lab and its assortment of chemicals and electrical components caught fire, and they had to completely rebuild it from scratch. So basically, they'd been rolling along, and they had to start completely over. 
and completely rebuild. So think about how much faster it would have gone. Yeah, if they hadn't had this big chunk of time where they had Starting to... completely over. Yeah. Uh, on September 3rd of 1928, which is just a little before that fire happened, the San Francisco Chronicle ran a story about Farnsworth Television. And the article described how Farnsworth's all-electronic approach was a total game-changer. So to quote... All television systems now in use employ a revolving disc, two feet in diameter, to break up or scan the image. A similar disc is at the receiving end, and the two discs must revolve at precisely the same instant and at precisely the same speed or blurred vision results. Farnsworth's system employs no moving parts whatsoever. Instead of moving the machine, he varies the electric current that plays over the image and thus gets the necessary scanning. The system is thus simple in the extreme, and one of the major mechanical obstacles to the perfection of television is thereby removed. This article is actually pretty detailed. It mentions the frame rate, which is 20 pictures per second, and the resolution, which is 8,000 elements, or pinpoints of light, for each picture. The screen he was using to demonstrate in 1928 was a mere 1.25 inches square. It is tiny... As we mentioned earlier, the Warehouse 13 viewers have a sense of what that looks like. (laughs) In the words of the Chronicle, it is a queer-looking little image in bluish light now, one that frequently smudges and blurs, but the basic principle is achieved, and perfection is now a matter of engineering. And at the time, uh, Farnsworth actually told the paper that he envisioned that his television receiver could actually be attached to a radio set, and he thought it was going to be sold at retail for about $100, which was a lot of money at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just interesting that he had this whole plan of how it was going to become a business. So while he was just a privately funded inventor and researcher, Radio Corporation of America, also known as RCA, was a giant. You couldn't legally build a radio in the United States without an RCA license. David Sarnoff, who was the acting president of RCA at the time, had established this business model of finding scientists and engineers, hiring them, and buying out their patent rights to grow RCA's legal holdings. And Sarnoff was really quick to protect his company's stake in the home entertainment market when he got wind of Farnsworth's new television. On November 18th of 1928, uh, an essay that was actually written by Sarnoff appeared in the New York Times, and it was entitled Forging an Electric Eye to Scan the World. And it assured readers that Farnsworth Television was nowhere near ready for the home market and that TVs would first be available to consumers from RCA and that they were going to beat Farnsworth to the market. This reminds me of the competing advertisements in our episode about the history of the sewing machine. A lot of this reminds me of it once we get into the RCA yeah. portion of it. Like, this fair. is not really a real thing. <laughs> Ours, Ours is the, is real, the thing. real thing. Yeah. A month later, another New York Times piece was published entitled Leaders Dispel Television Fears. And this one was not written by Sarnoff, but he was the main source for the article. This one encouraged readers to keep buying radios, particularly for the holidays, instead of waiting for television. Sarnoff even hired another inventor, Vladimir Zorkin, from the research team at Westinghouse to do a little bit of digging for him. He was on paper hired to head up uh, some labs, but it was clear that Sarnoff also wanted him to kind of try to figure out what the heck Farnsworth was actually up to. And Zworkin actually visited Farnsworth's San Francisco lab in 1930. And when he returned from his mission, he attempted to reverse engineer the technology he had seen while he was visiting Farnsworth. And there are some versions of this story that say that Zworkin actually telegraphed design and schemata information ahead to RCA so that the lab could get to work on it. And by the time he got back from visiting Farnsworth in San Francisco, the first model was there. But uh, those seem to be a little bit tall tale-ish. That's a, that would be a very quick build of things for people yeah. that did not have the firsthand account of it. Or 3D printers. So before you ask, why in the world would Farnsworth let a competitor just come visit his lab? Uh, Pretty sure that he did not know that that's what Zwerkin was. Yeah. 
There are accounts at the time that indicate that he thought Zorkin was still under the Westinghouse umbrella. And Westinghouse had shown some interest in Farnsworth's work. And so the financial backers of the Green Street Lab had been encouraging Farnsworth to sell his idea to Westinghouse, or at least license the rights to them. So remember, this was all going on right after the stock market crash. And while Farnsworth was an idealist and wanted to tinker and not think a whole lot about money, the people who were paying for his work were pretty financially nervous at this point. Yeah. And some accounts will say that it was clear that Zwarkian was still working for RCA and not Westinghouse. Um, but really, the the crux of the matter was that Farnsworth thought this was like a, oh, I'm going to come and visit and hang out and see what licensing options we might be able to work out, not and I'm coming to steal all of your ideas and technology trip. Right. So... Uh, but when Zwarkian's attempts to recreate Farnsworth device didn't work out, they completely fell flat. He wasn't able to deliver. Sarnoff actually decided that he was going to go visit Green Street himself. And he did so in spring of 1931. And there's some hint that he kind of thought he was the big businessman that was going to go and strong arm this foolish farm boy. Uh, but Farnsworth actually wasn't there at the lab when Sarnoff dropped in unannounced. But he was allowed to enter. Um, staff let him in. And he eventually, after looking around and returning uh, back to RCA headquarters, he'd made an offer to hire Farnsworth uh, into the RCA family and to buy Farnsworth's company and his patents. Uh, what he made was a pretty lowball offer. And Farnsworth said no. And this did not go over well at all. Yeah, and it really was lowball. Even the investors that have been kind of urging Farnsworth to look into selling because of the volatility of the stock market and the economy at the time, even they were like, eh, that doesn't sound like a fair offer to us. Um, so as with most game-changing inventions that also uh, involve corporate intrigue and bruised egos, a legal battle ensued. Backed by RCA's huge legal power, Vladimir Zorkin claimed that Farnsworth's work violated patents he already had on a similar invention. And in 1923, Zorkin had applied for a patent for an invention called an iconoscope, which was an electronic image scanner. So there were similarities. And this was the basis for a decade-long war that RCA waged against, waged against Farnsworth. Although it's of note that Zorkin never... Uh, was able to build a, a functioning model of his patent at all. He It was all theoretical. He never was able to make a, a real-world version of it. You're right. This is just like the sewing machine. It's <laughs> really, really similar. It's worth noting that other inventors were also on the trail of televised imagery. Charles Jenkins came up with a scanning drum to display moving silhouettes in 1924, and John Baird of Scotland had made mechanical image transmissions uh, using a transparent rod array in 1925. In 1928, Dr. Herbert Ives came up with a wire harness system for Bell Labs that uh, sent electrical impulses to 2,500 electrodes on its viewing screen individually. There were televisions being developed in France, Great Britain, and Russia by a number of different researchers. Yeah, so again, it really is similar to the sewing machine thing, where everybody knew this was kind of the next step, and they were all kind of working towards creating it, but some different approaches. But even with all of this work, and as was mentioned in the the newspaper article about him, like they talk about existing televisions too. So all of this work was going on, uh, and Zorkian's patent had happened before Farnsworth TV, but he was the first one to actually produce an electronic TV based on his research and designs. So now is when we um, bring back that high school chemistry teacher. Yeah. So the one that kept Filer's drawing, this turned out to be really important when it came to all the legal proceedings because he was able to testify that Farnsworth had diagrammed and described this television idea way back in 1921. The drawing itself, which he had hung on to, was also a huge boon to Farnsworth's case. And while the case was dragging on, Farnsworth was still working. Uh, in 1931, he started the Philco Radio Corporation's television department. And in exchange for uh, additional lab funding for his own research, Farnsworth had to move his family and his team to Philadelphia. That move was not really popular with his wife, Pam. She really loved San Francisco, and she often spoke... Uh, when, you know, asked about their lives or giving interviews about how, you know, 
the West was really where their heart was. Uh, but in 1933, so just a couple years later, Farnsworth left Philco and continued his work solo because Philco had decided that the television division did not really fit in their corporate vision any longer. So after moving his entire family kind of against their will, it turned out that wasn't going to work out so well. So irritating. In 1935, the U.S. Patent Office found in Farnsworth's favor. Uh, RCA appealed, but that same verdict came down again. And again, as you can imagine, there's some uh, bruised egos at play, even after, you know, this element of the legal proceedings was done. Uh, And in 1938, Farnsworth founded the Farnsworth Television and Radio Corporation. He was really ready to launch into the brave new world of consumer television and broadcast reception. But as an independent inventor, which was just a creature that was basically extinct uh, in this environment of explosive growth of corporate labs in the 30s and 40s, Farnsworth couldn't really stand up to the PR machine that RCA was able to crank out. At the 1939 World's Fair, RCA sponsored a television pavilion, and Sarnoff brokered a deal for the radio and television rights to air the opening ceremony. I feel like we should mention... Prior to being named acting president of RCA, Sarnoff had actually founded NBC Radio Network, which was owned by RCA. So it kind of sets the stage of, like, broadcast rights and bitter battles, really being at the heart of network television basically from day one. Like, it it was already about who had the rights to do what and kind of some, you know, backbiting and really aggressive business practices. So RCA had been working on television technology throughout these whole legal proceedings, and it was selling televisions and department stores leading up to this event. And it announced just prior to the fair opening that NBC was starting a regular broadcast schedule. And at this point, uh, Farnsworth realized he was outgunned. I think I read a, um, a statistic that right out of the gate, RCA had an easy 80% or greater market share. And there was just no way that Farnsworth was going to be able to keep up. Uh, so he actually sold RCA a non-exclusive license at that point for $1 million. After the RCA deal, Farnsworth was really exhausted and he had a nervous breakdown that resulted in him being hospitalized. He really struggled with depression and would continue to struggle with it for the rest of his life. And meanwhile, uh, World War II put television in a timeout because all manufacture of non-military electronics was banned by the U.S. government for the duration of the war. When the war ended, the Farnsworth Corporation was making its home in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and it started to produce television sets. But RCA had the resources to launch a much more successful manufacturing operation. Farnsworth just couldn't keep his company afloat. It was eventually purchased by International Telephone and Telegraph Company. And under IT&T, Farnsworth continued his research into television as well as nuclear fusion. The television division was shut down before very long, though. Yeah, so uh, at that point, Farnsworth's work in television had basically been shut out a little bit by big business. You know, he had battled RCA, and while he tried to still kind of struggle with a little small part of the market, it wasn't going to work out. And so when he sold his company thinking he was going to bolster his his television uh, work, they were like, no, nah, we don't really want to be in the TV business after all. So uh, he was, you know, shut out of television at that point. But he kept on inventing, and he certainly kept on studying science. In 1951, he was awarded an honorary doctorate of science by the Indiana Institute of Technology. Yeah, which was his first degree since he did not ever finish college. Uh, In 1957, he started the Farnsworth Research Corporation as its president and director of research. In 1967, he moved back to Utah and became head of a fusion lab at Brigham Young University. And just a year later, that lab actually changed names to Philo T. Farnsworth & Associates, and it moved to Salt Lake City. But within two years, uh, funds had dried up for the lab. In 1968, he was awarded his second honorary doctorate, this time from Brigham Young University, and he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. 1970 really marked... The beginning of the end for Farnsworth. Uh, As we mentioned, the lab was 
running out of money and he was forced to close it due to the lack of funds. And at that point, the depression that he had really been battling for decades, you know, it had really started in the, uh, in the thirties going through all of that battling with RCA and patent suits and then having to deal with the war offsetting their efforts. The depression just kind of won out at that point and he started drinking and drinking heavily and it really became a, a habitual drinking problem in the last few months of his life. He died of pneumonia on March 11th, 1971 in Salt Lake City. When he died, the televisions that were being made for consumer markets used components that were included in about 100 of his patents, although he really didn't have any wealth to speak of. On the other hand, Sarnoff died the same year, but very wealthy. Extremely wealthy. Uh, so well, yeah, you well, know what I have to say about that? <laughs> he didn't get to take it with him. <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is kind of one of those things where Farnsworth in so many ways was in the right, but it really did him no good, even though he won the patent lawsuit. And even though he made that big settlement with RCA, that money went towards funding a lab that was really struggling and didn't didn't turn out so well in terms of um, his his end of life quality. Uh, but after his passing, his wife, Pam, really worked tirelessly to try to establish her husband's image in a positive way and ensure that he was recognized as the visionary that he really was. And Farnsworth really uh, gave Pam a great deal of credit throughout his life for his most famous work. And he would often say that my wife and I started television. And they had worked uh, together. Pam had worked alongside her husband throughout his life in his various labs. And as he often became really engaged with his work, he would forget to eat. He would neglect to think about his health. He apparently had this weird habit where he was an insomniac. So at night he would go to bed and kind of give himself a problem to solve knowing that he would wake up and hoping that he would be working through it in that sort of half-sleep state. Like, he really kind of was not doing things that were great in terms of, like, his quality of health as he went on. Uh, but Pam was always the constant that kind of kept their lives in order despite his sort of odd behaviors and his tendency to get really overabsorbed into his work. In 1981, his 202 Green Street address in San Francisco, which was home to the lab where the first televised image was projected, was given a historical marker. There's also a memorial statue of Farnsworth at the Letterman Digital Arts Center in San Francisco. In 1990, the state of Utah gave the National Statuary Hall Collection in Washington, D.C. a statue of Farnsworth by artist James R. Avati, which had the inscription, Father of Television. Yeah. Which I love. Uh, in 2011, he was inducted into the San Francisco Hall of Fame. And in 2013, he was inducted into the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. And in his life, he had held uh, at least 160 patents, and he contributed to the development of many other things, uh, which we are actually relevant to, uh, you know, other recent podcasts we've been working on. He worked, some of his work contributed to the development of radar, infrared, electron microscopes, baby incubators. Uh, so when you go to like the ICU or the um, newborn ICU, the NICU, those incubators are in part due to the work that Farnsworth did and even astronomical telescopes. And Pem died in 2006, but their kids have continued this tradition of kind of keeping uh, his image alive and well. Uh, there was also, uh, in 2004, they announced a screenplay. Uh, New Line Cinema had optioned the screenplay from Aaron Sorkin about the life of Farnsworth, which never came to fruition. And in 2005, Sorkin uh, adapted it to the stage, and it's been produced a couple times. And maybe it will eventually go full circle and become a film again. But uh, if it ever does, I feel like I should pre-warn people that it's it's not historically accurate. Like, that was not the intent. No. Things were changed for dramatic effect. Is there a musical? I feel like there's a musical. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> there might be. I'm, I'm not a We're big... on the opposite. You're like, I hope not because singing. And I'm like, I hope so because of singing. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of musicals. There's nothing wrong with them. It's my personal, I don't like to watch people sing. I don't like to look in their mouths thing. I know that's my weird neurotic biz. I want fabulousness about Philo Farnsworth <laughs> with a big chorus line and lots of kicking. That doesn't seem right for him, though. He just wanted to quietly work in the lab. I want, that's why I the want it. The off people can all do the kicking. 
and the big <laughs> boisterous show numbers, whereas he could have quiet little songs in his lab. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, Farnsworth. It's interesting because in some circles, when you say Philo Farnsworth, people go, oh, I love his story. And other people just get a glazy look. Like he's he's kind of reached through history and hit certain people. And uh, a lot of people have become very interested in his story. But for many others, they have no idea he even existed, let alone led to the box that uh, inhabits our lives all the time. Yeah. Although modern day TV tech is very different, but. I'm hoping that all the Warehouse 13 fans who've been writing us and asking us to talk about Paracelsus <laughs> can take some temporary solace in go. this episode about Farnsworth. I love him. I I have a real soft spot for him, partially because I love television and entertainment and partially because, you know, he's just that guy who wants to work on projects and didn't really have business acumen and just was a great thinker that kind of was an underdog. Love him. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 